Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If all goes well, then later today, Boeing's Starliner should lift off to space on board an Atlas V, heading towards a rendezvous with the space station. This is going to be the spacecraft's second attempt to do this. As you probably remember, their first attempt, their orbital flight test number one, had all sorts of technical problems that resulted in the mission going into orbit at least successfully, but not being able to demonstrate a rendezvous with the International Space Station. So this has been a fairly long journey for Boeing Starliner. Like the project sort of first really appeared, I think like in early, like 2010, maybe even before that. And back then, first of all, it was pitched to NASA as a potential crew vehicle, but also it was all um, supposed to be in partly in collaboration with Bigelow Airspace, who would, were looking for a way to transport people to their space hotel. So uh, it, of course, ended up becoming part of the commercial crew program and ultimately was selected by NASA. And back when it was selected, it was considered to be the safe, reliable option because Boeing was a major contractor. SpaceX was this young upstart company that clearly didn't understand how aerospace worked because they were coming up with times and schedules, which didn't make any sense. Uh, as it happened, both projects were delayed quite a lot, although a lot of those delays in commercial crew were down to various politicians and congresspeople who were uh, basically, you know, still believed in the old cost plus way of doing things. They had all these hearings, they trotted out astronauts to say that, you know, the this new plan of having privately built spacecraft is going to result in the US losing its lead in aerospace. Obviously, that didn't happen, but still, they uh, resulted in the funding for the projects being curtailed for a few years before things really got going. But yeah, now SpaceX is performing regular service to the International Space Station. They're on flight four of the six that they were originally supposed to do. Boeing, uh, again, they have done one demo flight, which wasn't successful. They have to do one uncrewed flight, and then they can do a crewed demo flight and then they can fly their six contracted flights. So yeah, Starliner as a design, if you look at the capsule, it looks a lot like the Apollo capsule in terms of its profile, right? You know, Crew Dragon is big and vertical, whereas, the, whereas Starliner is much flatter. It's about four and a half meters wide or 15 feet in diameter. And that's much larger than the Apollo capsule, which was about 3.9 meters across. And you got to remember, because, you know, you're dealing with volumes, then it's the difference to the power of three. Turns out that you have about 11 cubic meters of usable internal volume on the Starliner, as opposed to six on the Apollo capsule. And, you know, so part of this is just it's a larger structure, but also in the intervening 50 years, a lot of the hardware that was required on Apollo has been shrunk down to much smaller heart pieces. You know, you don't no longer need multiple dedicated rack size units to perform basic communications. You can integrate some of those stuff into software. But yeah, uh, for comparison, Crew Dragon, by the way, it has an internal volume of about 9.3 cubic meters. So Starliner is a little bit bigger and it actually has one extra seat. So uh, both of the spacecraft were originally pitched for crews of up to seven. NASA wanted a crew of four, but later in the contract, Boeing negotiated to add an extra seat because they wanted to make more money from their launches. And the deal is they got to add an extra seat and assuming that the fifth crew member doesn't interfere with the mission, then they can sell that seat to anybody that wants to fly to space. Of course, the way this is going to work is they're going to have to stay in space for six months because as far as I can tell, there's no, it's not likely anytime soon that we're going to have overlap where you have two Starliners arriving at the same time and there's like a one week crossover. So this is going to be sailing to professional level astronauts, which I think really means that NASA is probably going to be buying a fifth seat on Starliner for, uh, you know, to put their astronauts and maximize their, um, their performance or whatever. So anyway, yes, yeah, Starliner has the five seats. It has a commander seat and a pilot seat. The control panels are much more tactile. They have actual switches and knobs as opposed to SpaceX's big flat touchscreens, which only have a very small number of buttons on them. The spacecraft is designed to fly to space station, stay in space for six months attached to the station, and then return to Earth. Um, 
And interestingly, the Starliner is the first US capsule which will be landing on airbags on the land. Now, uh, obviously, old capsules used to land in the water. The space shuttle landed on a runway. SpaceX originally pitched that they would land on the Super Draco thrusters, but NASA wasn't sufficiently confident with that, partly because even if the Draco thrusters were 100% reliable, they still weren't comfortable with legs that would have to extend through the heat shield. So yeah, SpaceX are landing in the water. The landing sites are basically big flat, you know, ranges, things like uh, you know, White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico or Edwards Air Force Base in California. So the conical crew capsule obviously contains all the stuff required for recovery. It has the docking adapter and there is a hinged cover which will open up in space and close for return to Earth. There's a set of 12 thrusters which are used for orientation during descent and of course parachutes and the landing airbags. Now, most of the propulsion of this actually is in the service module, which is on the back. Now, the service module is much more complex than what SpaceX has. SpaceX's trunk on the Dragon basically just provides solar panels. In the case of Starliner, most of the propulsion and power is here. So the, the service module has these four thruster clusters around the outside, these sort of rectangular box-shaped things on the side. And those contain, like, T uh, 20 maneuvering thrusters for on-orbit maneuvering. These are high thrust thrusters that will produce about 1,500 pounds of thrust each. That's about 700 kilograms. There are 28 RCS, small RCS thrusters, and those are required for like orienting the spacecraft and you know rendezvous and docking. Or now those are much smaller. Those are about 45 kilograms of thrust. And then there's the four large launch abort engines. Those generate something like 20 tons of thrust each. So this will allow the spacecraft to escape in the event of an emergency. All of these are fed from a common fuel supply, which is your traditional hypergolics. I believe it's monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. There's four fuel tanks, four oxidizer tanks, and then a couple of tanks for pressurization. The solar cells are on the base of the module, which protects them during launch but it does mean that the spacecraft probably has to face with its you know, butt to the sun. That means the crew on board aren't going to see sunrises unless they deliberately move it out of this orientation. Of course, they're going to get to see plenty of sunrises in space on the space station. There's no shortage of those when you're, turning, you're flying across the Earth every 90 minutes. Now, if you compare this to Dragon, Dragon keeps all of its thrusters in the main capsule, which is recovered. And that probably helps reduce its cost. Starliner dumps a lot of its thrusters when it lands and therefore it's having to buy a new batch of thrusters from Aerojet Rocketdyne every time. There's a lot of stuff that's outsourced on Starliner, but the higher thrust engines do help a lot because I guess it can make its orbit trim maneuvers, it can change orbits a lot faster than the Dragon. If you've ever watched the re-entry, for example, of the Crew Dragon, they will make their deorbit burn and it will take 10 minutes for them to fire because they're using these tiny little Draco thrusters in the front of the spacecraft and those only generate very small amounts of thrust. This uh, Starliner is able to make these maneuvers a lot more quickly and the mission timelines reflect this. So the launch vehicle is the Atlas V N22 and in the standard Atlas V numerical designation system that means no fairing N two engines on the Centaur and two solid rocket boosters to launch it. Now, on the Falcon 9, the Dragon fits very neatly on top of it. It's almost the same diameter as a spacecraft, but uh, Starliner is fat, right? The diameter of the Centaur is like three meters, whereas the diameter of the Starliner is about 4.5 meters. And then you've got to add the extra width of the service module with those thruster pods. Now, originally it was designed with a sort of conical fairing on the backside that would, you know, smooth the outline down to the rocket. Turns out that in wind tunnel tests, this was not ideal. And I don't actually have the complete information on what happens, but apparently at transonic speeds, they start to generate shock waves, which would impinge onto the side of the Centaur, and that would stress the rocket in ways that was undesirable. So instead, they have this skirt that comes down and it creates a hard join and apparently that's long enough that it moves the shockwaves past the sensitive centaur area. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure how it, what else it does, but it certainly 
it's not pretty. I'm just going to say that it looks kind of ugly, to be honest, but whatever. You'll also look around the outside and there's this, like, perforated fence, which is some sort of aerodynamic structure that sits between the thruster pods. I'm not sure what that's supposed to do. I would love to know more because, you know what? Uh, it's always fun to learn things. Because this is like a private space company, a lot of this stuff isn't actually public. You know, NASA, when they worked on the space shuttle and the Apollo spacecraft, all those documentation, all that, all those documents would ultimately make it into the public domain because they were produced by a government organization. But because this is a private organization, a lot of these internal technical details are still proprietary and they're owned by the private companies. So SpaceX doesn't, has a lot of stuff they don't reveal. And Boeing clearly isn't having a lot, you know, isn't letting everybody know. So I don't know if there are cool tests showing like the aerodynamic effects of this transition. But I, again, would love to know more. So anyway, as I said, this is the second flight, but actually it's the second attempt at this second flight. And last year, in the middle of the year, they were planning to perform their second test flight. And unfortunately, they couldn't actuate some of the valves after the vehicle had been sitting on the pad for a while. And it appears what happened was the you know highly corrosive nitrogen tetroxide had leaked past some of the valves, which is normal because you can't have a valve that is perfectly sealed, but somehow, Moisture had also intruded into the other side of the valve. These had reacted together, producing nitric acids or nitric oxides, which had corroded something sufficiently so the valve was jammed. Ultimately, after failing to get this off the pad, they had to roll it back, demate the entire vehicle. They've replaced the service module, and this is with a fresh service module, and hopefully this one isn't going to have the same corrosion issues. And Hopefully, if this performs the launch, it will you know, get into its target orbit. It will begin its rendezvous with the space station. And then uh, a day or so from now, it will dock at the front of the space station uh, because that node is currently free. If you remember, Crew 4 came around from underneath the station and docked on the Zenith node, leaving the front node empty after Crew 3's Dragon departure departed. Uh, it'll stay there for a couple of weeks. It's going to carry some you know, cargo and stuff on board. It's going to carry Rosie the Rocketeer wearing a Boeing spacesuit. So that is obviously there to demonstrate that the, you know, spacesuit works in this environment. The Rosie the Rocketeer is a, um, a mannequin, basically, with all sorts of sensors on board to verify that the forces of launch are within the capabilities, uh, you know, the, the limits of our frail human bodies. And a few weeks from now, it will then undock from the space station perform its deorbit and then land at one of the sites. And then hopefully that will approve the vehicle finally for crew to go. And that will be ideally later in the year because we'd really like to get some redundancy in the crew launch capabilities. And after that, they've got six launches going forwards. So yeah, assuming this works correctly and the capsule performs as uh, required by NASA, then we could see the actual crewed flight test later this year. Perhaps Q4, I think, is the earliest we could reasonably expect it. As of right now, there are two astronauts assigned to it, Barry, uh, Butch Wilmore, at, oh wait, Barry Wilmore and Michael Fink. There is a third seat. Uh, Chris Ferguson from Boeing was originally going to be on there. He, if you remember, he was on the last shuttle mission to the space station and he was working at Boeing, so Boeing put him on as a, you know, um, as an employee test ride along, partly for the symbolism of potentially being able to return to the space station. SpaceX, of course, has since won that. And uh, instead, yeah, he's dropped out and we're not sure if the third seat will be filled by anyone. Now, uh, Nicole Mann was originally going to be on that flight. She has since been reassigned to Crew 5, which will be later this year. The first actual operational Starliner flight could be as early as March 2023. And we know that Jeanette Epps and uh, Sunita Williams are currently assigned to that. There's two empty seats. Well, technically, there's three empty seats, but there's two empty NASA seats right now. John Casada was going to be on that. But again, he has been reassigned to SpaceX Crew 5. So later this year. And yeah, hopefully... That will lead to a long and prosperous time for at least the next six flights as uh, you know, Boeing and Starliner use up their batch of Atlas V boosters. 
After that, we don't know what's going to happen yet. Starliner could, in theory, fly on any operational rocket that is human rated. But as of right now, the only operational human rocket, uh, operational rocket with human rating, other than <laughs> other than uh, the Atlas V, is uh, SpaceX's Falcon Nine. Now. NASA wouldn't necessarily be happy with that because they would like the idea of dissimilar redundancy. NASA would really like it to fly on the ULA's Vulcan, but that would require human rating Vulcan and somebody's going to have to pay for it. And right now, Boeing doesn't want to pay for it, ULA doesn't want to pay for it, and NASA doesn't necessarily want to pay for it. So somewhere in there, there's going to be some negotiating, but I'm pretty sure that what we're going to see is uh, Vulcan will become human rated one way or another. And, you know, after, you know, mid 2020s, we'll see Starliner flying on Vulcan going forward. But we don't know. Right? <laughs> Things could go one way or another. And the Falcon 9 is already there and probably cheaper and ready to go. So, yeah, I will be watching later today, hoping that this gets off successfully and makes it into orbit and operates this time. Um, you know, it, it could be that it's delayed for some technical reason or for weather, and that's fine, right? <laughs> Better to have a scrub than a RUD or RUD. And if it's successful, I hope we see them getting flown and we see some, you know, more diversity in the engineering capabilities of the US space program. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.